Thank you very much, Mark, for agreeing to come and talk to us this evening. You're an old friend of Channel McGilchrist. I first came across you um, through the fact that you used to write a column, I think I said, I'm right in saying used to write a column for The Guardian on spiritual matters, amongst other things. And um, for those of you who don't know Mark very well, he, he is a remarkable man. He, he is a physicist who then retrained in theology, and he is a philosophical theologian or a theological philosopher, however you like to put it. But the day job is being a psychotherapist. So he's a man with an extraordinary broad range of understanding the nature of reality. He's the author of books on uh, a number of aspects of spirituality, and most interesting to me of all is his latest book, which is a guide to Dante's Divine Comedy. It's a, it's a marvellous book. I do recommend it. Um, most of the, in fact, all of the other commentaries on Dante that I have read have been very heavily skewed towards literary matters, literary tropes, literary history, um, and so on. But what Mark does is to enter into the spiritual world of Dante and his contemporaries, which is so very different from our own, and none the worse for that. We can learn so much from it. So that as Virgil guides Dante through hell, purgatory, and paradise, Mark guides us uh, as very willing uh, companions and, and readers along with him through that very great work, one of the greatest works, of course, of Western literature. So here is Mark, without further ado, and he will talk and then the two of us will have a short um, to and fro about what he's been talking about. Hey, look, well, thank After which there will be Q&A from all of you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, look, look, thanks very much indeed for inviting me, asking me. I'm delighted to um, try and say something, um, having you know had the chance to engage with what you're you're doing once more. And um, I'm going to put some slides up straight away because I'm going to talk um, using slides much, um, as I hope that. That now, so I hope you people can see that. Someone shout out if you can't see the Mona Lisa on your screen, along with another image. And I've put this um, image up, first of all. It's, it's the Mona Lisa, of course, Michelangelo's Mona Lisa, and also Giolandio's old man and his grandson. And I put them up because when I first read The Master and His Emissary, um, you know, a while ago now, um, and wanted to know what this neuroscientist who also knew a lot about Western culture and was quite as nuanced about that as he was about what goes on in the brain. Um, I was quite shocked because that is a very rare thing, um, even now, certainly was back then. But I wanted to know kind of what this might feel like. What was, what was this all about? And um, these two images came to my mind um, because they both have this very um, particular sense of the individual there present. I mean, I particularly like the Gian Dio because he's painted that old man's warty nose right in the middle of the image. You know, this is definitely someone. And yet, at the same time, there's this sense of a timelessness um, with uh, particularly the backdrops, which are familiar to us in Renaissance imagery. Um, and so bringing together a holistic sense of encounter um, with these images. And I felt this, what, this is what must, Ian must be about. So in this first sort of just few minutes, I just wanted us to kind of get into um, Ian's world, into the zone where this consciousness is awakened. Um, and hopefully then that will help illuminate what I want to try and say for the bulk of the talk. Um, just to pick up on one of Ian's ways of putting this, um, the key ability is the presencing of the world. So this is about comprehending, not just calculating. It's about experiencing and not just modeling. Um, it's about attuning into what's going on and not just measuring that. Um, it's about understanding in the deepest possible way, a participative way of understanding. And so not just measuring as if we have the view from nowhere. Um, 
And it's about, you know, living and dying and the fullness of that and not just being kind of on or off a one or a zero, you might say. Um, now, many will be familiar with that and perhaps also with the critiques, therefore, that Ian brings to the modern world. And just to run by some of that side of things, I wanted to draw on a conversation that two people who I've been influenced by a lot um, had quite a while ago now, but the physicist David Bohm got together with uh, philologist Owen Barfield. I guess that David Bohm is known to people. Owen Barfield was the great friend of J.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and was very interested in consciousness too, how awareness changes over time. And they had a very fascinating conversation, which I've done a sort of long transcription of that you can find on my website. But in this conversation, just to pick up on a couple of things that Bohm says to get us into the critique of our times that Ian offers. So Bohm said, knowledge forced into grooves and compartments are a form of distortion. They hold you rigidly fixed and lead to self-deception in the long run. And then he continues and says, conversely, intelligence involves paying attention to what is between the categories, not in them. We have to be able to negate a set of categories to see their limitations. And then he, he says many, many things, but just to drop in another thought, he said, um, it's why positive thinking, and he was thinking of the precursors to positive psychology here, is so superficial. You know, all these admonitions to think positively all the time, they may make you cheerful, but they lead you into very fixed categories. Now, the direction of travel that I want to particularly take this evening is to think especially about, you might call the theological or religious um, implications of this wider consciousness that Ian's inviting us to recall and rediscover and remake um, around things like eternity, spirit, the sacred, God even. And so let me just touch on, to evoke some of that, um, this thought, which comes from Ian's work as well, and from this very early Christian figure, Dennis the Areopagite, um, a great sort of mapper of inner life, both inner life of the human psyche, but inner life of the cosmic mind as well. And Ian spotted this remark that he makes in one of his letters, which of course has immediate resonance for those of us who know his work. The tradition of the theologians is twofold. On the one hand, ineffable and mystical, on the other, manifest and more knowable. The ineffable is interwoven with what can be uttered. The one persuades and contains within itself the truth of what it says. The other affects and establishes the soul with God by initiations that do not teach anything. So that's to begin almost like with an invocation of this consciousness. We're sort of launched, I hope now, I hope you can even sort of feel the shift of consciousness and awareness that Ian's work invites us to consider as a possibility. And to begin to develop what that might actually be like and how we might practice it, how we might stir that awareness and become more aligned to it so that it becomes our daily sense of things and perceptions. I wanted to, in a second part now, just offer some clarifications that I feel are around in the sort of general discussion of these things. Um, it's the kind of thing which you maybe hear as a psychotherapist. It's the kind of thing which you might read in books of self-help, um, you know, even quite sophisticated and nuanced ones, um, but which often I think cause confusion and so elicit a kind of stuckness. And I'm going to use references particularly from Dante and William Blake, who are two key guides for me in this kind of awareness, as well as some others. And consider four thoughts to start now. Um, one on the notion of integration, psychological integration. A second on the notion of flow. A third on the reality of alienation. And a fourth on the value of aggression. And incidentally, for those of you who knows 
Ian's work well, you'll spot how liberally I do draw on his work. But maybe there's also one or two differences of nuance, um, which um, you might feel coming through as well and might be wanting to pick up later. So, first of all, integration. Here's a familiar face to many, no doubt. Um, the young, charismatic, striking Carl Gustav Jung. And the point I wanted to make here is that those who are into Jungian psychology often talk about the value of integration. Maybe as they talk about the value of shadow work, the value of individuation. And there's something in all that, of course, but I think it can become a distraction. And particularly when it's perceptual transformation that you seek. There's so, there's definitely some need, you know, not to be a fragmented self, um, to understand something about your shadow, um, because otherwise you get pushed around by the fragmented self and the shadow constantly hijacks your experience. So you need to understand something of these things. But when integration, somehow becoming an individual, a whole, I think when it's presented as a goal for the psychological quest, um, it, it suggests a rather isolated, singular frame of reference. And I think this is partly a legacy of Jung's tendency on many occasions, not always, but on many occasions to psychologize human experience, to suggest it's all somehow a product of the human psyche. Um, those of you who know Jung's work will know that he's um, he can seem and sound quite different in different places. Um, sometimes he's not like this at all. But particularly when he says, look, I'm just an empirical psychologist. I report what I see. Um, it can lead to this sense of uh, the psyche being rather isolated, um, very splendid in its productions, um, but not much sense of connection to that which isn't the human. Um, and I think that working on yourself is definitely a preparation that's necessary, but a perceptual expansion is to move beyond just your personal integration. It's to, in a way, move beyond yourself, although, of course, you discover more about yourself in that very process as well. And to illustrate that, I wanted to talk a little bit about William Blake in a first pass at William Blake this evening. Um, and William Blake's, particularly his later works, can be described as offering almost four levels of perception. And it's not that neat and tidy, of course. This is just um, a first model of what Blake's doing. Um, and Blake is definitely wanting us to be in touch with reality direct through his poetry and verse. But for the sake of saying something relatively simple that I hope will also be suggestive, he talks about four levels of perception, which he calls Ulro, Generation, Beulah, and Eternity. And I wanted to relate that to this sense of fragmentation and the whole and perception and going beyond. So in this first level of perception that Blake calls Ulro, and you can see one of his images that show that here with his figure of Eurism, who's fascinated not by the light around him, but by the compasses in his hand, as if this measuring device would tell him all he needs to know. Um, in Ulro, um, there's a huge tendency to kind of screen off reality, um, to fragment it and only be interested in that which the conscious self can grasp and grapple with. But Blake realized that that is a very unsatisfying way to live and that the human tendency is always actually to want to know for more. And so he talks about a second level of perception, which he calls generation. Here's an image from his great poem, Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, which shows loss at his anvil, talking to his spectre that hovers above him. I'm gonna say more about spectres later this evening, but for now, just think about loss and generation and in generation, um, we do try to make things in the world, hence, you know, loss with his hammer and his anvil and his tongs there and so on and his bellows and his furnaces. Um, but we try to make something of the world mostly 
through our limited perceptions and so by manipulating or trying to control things insofar as we understand them. So it does some good, it builds some things, but it's it's sort of limited. It tends to spiral in on itself and, and lead to anxiety and worries and hence loss here gazing at the face of his spectre hovering above him. And so it leads to a sort of a second crisis that can be a breakthrough to a third level of perception and integration and beginning to reach beyond now, um, which Blake called Beulah. Now in Beulah, um, it's a rather lovely state of mind. Um, he often uses the word Mooney when he talks about Beulah. And there is a great effort and some success at integrating things, perhaps in a dance. Um, and it's a happy state of mind and feels like um, it's maybe reached its goal in life. But there's a sort of nagging, creeping sense still of instability, of defensiveness, of worry about whether this um, happiness can be sustained, whether these pleasures, this dance um, can go on. And so this, this instability, Blake realises, leads to attempts to defend Beulah. And in particular, he puts morality in this state of Beulah, morality wanting to preserve what is valued, um, but by making rules and laws in order to do that. And so you can sort of feel the tendencies of generation and all row starting to appear in the Beulah state of mind. I mean, Blake's quite strong about morality. He talks about the wastes of moral law, the idea that morality in its legalistic sense wastes life. And so this instability in Beulah, though, it can drag you down, but it can also precipitate the fourth level of perception and integration that leads to the perception of things that really is truly beyond the self, but then also realising that it's part of the self too, the notion of eternity. And here's Blake's famous image of Jacob's ladder. And in eternity, all the capacities that we have, for sure, intuition and discernment, reason and emotion are working together, but they're working together to release us into the wider sense of things, this expansive vision. And so the way that Blake's depicted this, I think, is very, very brilliant, because what you can see descending and ascending upon Jacob's ladder there um, are various facets, you might say, represented in personified forms of our capacities that link us to the capacities of heaven and so knowing yourself to be part of a much wider not just self but world and cosmos and whole as well so you can see for example one of the figures there with a pair of compasses all rose compasses you might say but now they're in collaboration with all sorts of other facets that we might have and so open us up to a wider reality and here's just some lines from Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, that perhaps capture some of this expansive vision. So you can get a feel in the poetry of how it's so much more than personal integration. Blake writes, the innumerable chariots of the Almighty appeared in heaven, and Bacon and Newton and Locke, and Milton and Shakespeare and Chaucer. I just note that the scientists Bacon, Newton and Locke are hand in hand in this heavenly vision with Milton, Shakespeare and Chaucer, the more intuitive, poetic forms as well. And then Blake continues and says, and the four faces of humanity fronting the four cardinal points of heaven, going forward, forward irresistible from eternity to eternity. So again, note, this is not about being cut off from reality. It's the four faces fronting the four cardinal points, going forward, forward. It's saying yes to life. It's expansive. Nothing is hindered here. And then Blake continues, and they converse together in visionary forms dramatic, which bright redounded from their tongues in thunderous majesty, in visions, in new expanses, creating exemplars of memory and of intellect, creating space, creating time according to the wonders of divine, of human imagination. So notice this is a kind of cooperation, expanded perception that we're called to play a part but we realize that creating space, creating time is also this tremendous dynamic of the divine imagination that meets the human imagination. And so Blake says, on chariots of gold and jewels with living creatures, starry and flaming with every color, 
lion, tiger, horse, elephant, eagle, dove, fly, worm, all these wondrous serpents clothed in gems and rich array human eyes. So there's a linking here of the whole of the cosmos, what we would call the natural world, as well as the supernatural, including the fly and the worm. Everything is involved. So that is to say um, nothing less than all, as Blake also puts it, um, is on the agenda when we're thinking about this perceptual transformation, not just my kind of personal sorting myself out, but that might well be necessary because otherwise the ways in which one isn't personally sorted out becomes too much of a distraction. So that's a first clarification, I hope. Now, a second one has to do with flow and particularly the relationship between flow and wholeness or flow and unity. Because I think with this perceptual awareness that grows, there's a realization that unity is not static. Um, oneness is not static either. Um, it may not even be about agreement when it comes to human unity. In fact, probably it won't be about agreement because agreement would be to limit things in a sense of containing it and cutting things off. Whereas disagreements that can produce a sense of dialogue and expansion, uh, growing awareness of what is not otherwise perceived is really important. And so this unity and wholeness uni um, and flow really matters. Bohm puts it, David Bohm, to go back to that conversation I mentioned before, he says, wholeness is not finally ultimately capable of being grasped as an absolute totality. Wholeness is unbroken, seamless, but a free flow of action and thought. And I particularly love the way that Blake captures this in this famous quatrain from his notebook here. Sometimes it's called Eternity. And he writes in these famous lines, he who binds to himself the joy does the winged life destroy, but he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. One could spend a whole lifetime trying to realize that in one's own being, and maybe that'd be a very good way to spend a lifetime, in fact, kissing the joy as it flies and living in eternity's sunrise. But Dante, too, was onto this, particularly in the Paradiso. So just to give a first name check to Dante as well, who I'm going to bring up a few times now. Here's an old, uh, quite an early woodcut showing the moment in the Divine Comedy in the Paradiso where Dante and Beatrice arrive in the sphere of the sun. And in the heavenly sun, they meet a bunch of individuals who spoke during their mortal lives very brightly about divine things. But what's so fascinating about the figures that Dante and Beatrice see is that these individuals disagreed with one another in life. And in particular, there's two characters, Thomas Aquinas and another chap called Seagar of Brabant. Thomas Aquinas, a great articulator of Christian things, and Seagar of Brabant was a great articulator of Islamic things, particularly Aravoist, Ar Averroist philosophy. And in life, in mortal life, um, Thomas Aquinas had actually declared Seagar of Brabant a heretic, which was a serious business in the 12th and 13th century. Um, but here in the sphere of the sun, they realized that their brightness on earth was but a sharing, a reflection, um, an attempt to understand and amplify the divine brightness itself. And so what was disagreement on earth in the heaven of the sun becomes a joyous, sometimes dispute, but dispute in the sense of wanting to raise everybody's awareness and heart to a wider and wider perception. Um, it's the beginnings of entering infinity, um, where in one moment something can seem like it's a contradiction, but then in another moment you realise that it's actually a joyful amplification of that which was there all along. And it's a really important moment for Dante as he journeys through the paradise, because one of the things I love about the paradise is that it's quite as dynamic as the purgatorio. It's definitely more dynamic than the, than the inferno, which is rather a stuck place. Um, and so there's this sense that in some ways the journey is just beginning at this moment. But the reason why it's just beginning is because Dante can now ride um, this flow of 
difference and similarity and contrast and similar and union in order to appreciate more and more of the divine life and it's why at the end of the divine comedies you may well know um the oneness that da that dante perceives is this spinning dynamic unity and so the famous last words of the divine comedy are that i knew myself to be spinning like a perfect wheel with the lun the love that moves the sun and the other stars so that's a second sort of thought stroke clarification that i hope is of some use now thirdly i wanted you to say something about alienation um because you know one can worry a lot about the way that we become alienated from each other from the world from these spiritual realms as well and there's a lot to worry about but owen barfield the chap there on the right again he had an idea about this which i think is important to remember as well because he argued that cultural consciousness cultural awareness does swing and move and shift over time he he talked about evolution of consciousness in relation to this but he he thought that the periods of alienation and withdrawal from a participation with wider things he thought they have an inner purpose even though they bring pain and suffering and um, even disaster and the reason is is that when we feel alienated or withdrawn we're thrown onto ourselves and in the very lack of life feel we've got to make something of life again and I put it to you that Ian's work itself is very much like this, that it's sprung out of this particular moment as a wrestling with the alienation that we um, can become so familiar with, but also as a stepping stone back into a new kind of participation with the world that in time will be enriched and informed by the period in the wilderness. And so Barfield talked about this moves swinging like a pendulum that is part of our perhaps not sort of the growth of our consciousness but certainly more cyclically different awarenesses of things because we also become aware in this alienation that older forms of consciousness particularly say indigenous consciousness now has its own genius its own insight its own sophistication that we can learn from to renew our own genius and insight and sophistication now you know, you get this being played out, I think, quite a lot um, in, say, popular science. Here's one of the images which the James Webb telescope has been beaming to us in recent weeks and months. Absolutely astonishing image of star fields. But when the scientists talk about this, what's so fascinating is you're not quite sure whether it's supposed to be a picture of alienation or, through its beauty, a kind of mental connection with the cosmos. Because in one moment they will wax lyrical about its gorgeousness and its astonishing wonder and so on but the next minute they'll tell you that this is an image of light years of dust in an empty space um, that knows nothing of us um, and you know leaves us lost in the kind of vastness um what are we supposed to make of these pictures and the tension um, that the very image throws up and that the way scientists talk about it is very fascinating, I think, about this struggle to reconnect. Um, I even wanted to say something about the culture wars in relation to this, um, to move to a different part of the current conversation rather abruptly. But, you know, the trans war, um, the business of sexual identity as a whole, I think that part of the reason why this is so difficult is because it it's reflecting again our sense of alienation more from ourselves perhaps now than from the cosmos and um, but someone like virginia wolf she engaged with this of course too most famously in her book a room of one's own but she comes to this point herself where a new kind of awareness becomes possible uh, that sort of transcends the division but somehow would never have been arrived at if it wasn't for her struggle to find a room of her own. And she calls it the androgynous mind. And she says the thing about the androgynous mind is that it's resonant and porous. And that in particular, as she writes, all desire to protest, to preach, to proclaim an injury, to pay off a score, to make the world witness of some hardship or grievance was fired out of him and consumed. 
And the hymn there that she's talking about is Shakespeare, because for her, William Shakespeare is the best example of this androgynous mind, because when you read Shakespeare, you learn so much about his characters and almost nothing about him, which is why the discussion about the quest for the historical Shakespeare goes on and on forever. He had this androgynous mind that transcended itself and in that transcendence became resident and porous to all sorts of other states and minds of the human world, um, having relinquished the need to protest and preach and so on. Therefore, his poetry flows from him free and unimpeded, Virginia Woolf writes. And I think that is another note of hope for me that doesn't just say we need to move on from these culture wars, which in some ways is self-evidently true, but there's something that is actually being wrestled with in the culture war as well that's important to take note of. Now, that said, um, I think there's also a need for a certain kind of ruthlessness or aggression um, when it comes to seeking these things too. And I wanted about just flagging up some of this by uh, mentioning uh, a myth that Ian uses in the new books, um, an, the Iroquois myth of Skyholder and Flint. Um, here's a, um, a, a book that tells the myth that I found on the internet. Um, and Ian tells the story um, of Skyholder and Flint, who are two grandchildren of Sky Woman. And she's a kind of demiurgic creator. And in the version of the myth that, that Ian relates, Flint kills his mother to be born too quickly. He's jealous of his older brother's creativity. And so Flint is either a villain or a trickster. And so parallels the kind of evil or chaotic side of humanity. Whereas Skyholder, the elder brother, knows the being and light from whence they came. And Ian loves this myth because of the obvious um, sense of balance that is needed um, and Skyholder needing to know how to maintain a relationship, but one that has the right distance from Flint, from the younger brother um, and his sort of tricksterish side um, that is present in the cosmos as well. Um, but, you know, when I read about it, there's there's other versions of this myth and um, which struck me too. And um, good myths, of course, do that. So that's the whole point. They're these dynamic ways of engaging with a dynamic world. And in this one that I read too, um, Skyholder, the older brother, must imprison or defeat Flint. And there's a kind of truth in that um, because much like Blake knew with Loss and his spectre, sometimes you have to recognize that something that's been offered to you is not about achieving a balance, but is actually needing to be denied because as Blake put it, it's a negation. Um, and so um, Skyholder needing to imprison or even murder Flint mm. is a reflection of that necessity sometimes too. You know, negations in Blake are different from contraries. Um, contraries are this kind of polar opposite that creates an energy or dynamic that can precipitate new kinds of perception. But what Loss certainly concludes when it comes to engaging with his spectre in Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, is that the spectre is a kind of nothing pretending to be something, is pretending to know the truth of the whole, but actually is the path to eternal disconnection from the whole. And so at the end, the spectre is kind of shattered into a thousand pieces and returns to the cosmos to be reabsorbed um, and so redeemed in that way. So something about transformation being not just about integration, not just this static unity, but a kind of flow. The alienation that may actually have meaning if we engage with it, and then a certain kind of ruthlessness that sometimes we have to draw on as well. I hope that they're kind of suggestive thoughts um, when we think about these things. Now, in the third part now, um, I wanted to, in a way, ask, you know, what difference some of these thoughts might make. And pick up on something that I noticed that Ian's often asked about, actually, in his 
interviews and discussions with people, which is what to do, you know, what next? And how can we practice live this perception that you're so brilliantly stirring up in our curiosity? And he often remarks that the what to do question is a bit of a left hemisphere fixation. And what we need is a conversion of awareness and perhaps even reading his books is the best way to achieve that. And there's a lot of truth in that. Um, but I thought I could pick up this question about how we can be differently in the world and not fixated on fixing, and but relating to things and seeing things differently through a kind of attention that might grow through an unfolding, sort of escaping analysis paralysis, you might like say, and beginning to rediscover and align and know this vision showing up in our lives so that all sorts of unseen potentials and different possibilities might start to take us on the journey that Dante knows, particularly, say, in the Paradiso, or that Blake describes particularly in Eternity, and um, from infinity to infinity, from more to more. So here's a bunch of shorter suggestions now, I hope, that might suggest some of that. A first thing is to be interested in the darkness, to be interested in the critique. Um, this is not a new thought. Um, but just to say a little bit more about it now, um, because this is about understanding the darkness, understanding the alienation, not just for its own sake, but in order that a kind of space might appear around it that can be become the beginnings of a new sense of light. And I put this image up because this is one from the Inferno, where Dante and Virgil, there to the right, are in the sphere that holds the lovers who have got caught up in their love. They think that romantic love, particularly sort of more courtly love in Dante's time, was going to liberate them, was going to take them to divine awareness. And yet it's trapped them because they've become obsessed with their lover and their own pleasure and enjoyment of that state sort of the ecstasy of it, the peak experience, if you like, the kind of trip of love. Um, so, you know, still a great risk for people today. And what's so interesting about this moment for Dante is that he collapses and hence Blake shows him here lying on the ground. And I think what this is saying is that this is kind of a moment where he encounters a darkness that he can't keep his mind about quite literally. And so he passes out, he swoons. And the risk there is that he would stay in this kind of infernal state and never find a way out. Um, but luckily he's got Virgil, he's got a guide, and certainly in William Blake's world, even the darkest place um, can shine with light. And hence Blake puts this um, kind of golden globe um, up in the right-hand corner there. And it's, it's a really important moment for Dante in the Inferno because what he realises when he comes round is that he's got to try and understand, to have a mind, to bring his intellectual capacities almost to what's going on. Because then his love and his desire um, and indeed his articulation of things in the poetry can um, become more developed and so keep him going on his journey. And this is, you know, taken to quite a lot of extremes in the Divine Comedy. One of the great reveals at the bottom of the Inferno is that the way out of hell is not to sort of turn around once you've seen the worst, but actually is to continue on the very body of Lucifer through the frozen heart of this dark reality. I hope you can see here in Botticelli's image the, the kind of cartoon of Dante and Virgil climbing onto the body of Lucifer and moving right through the heart of darkness and finding in that turning around that they're now climbing out. And I think this is a profound insight that develops this idea of understanding the darkness that in this case, anyway, in Dante's case, um, what he learns is that the power of envy, usury, hate, all the other things that he finds trapping him, trapping people in, in hell that light 
being and love actually are more powerful than even the greatest darkness. And it's only when you might say you've seen hate in full form that you can know love can survive it, that when you've encountered the darkness, you know that even a flicker of light can begin to dispel it. And I think that's part of the meaning of the way out of the inferno being right on Lucifer's body. And that that is the way to seed, not just a new way of looking at the world that you hope you might get glimpses of, and if you're lucky, can grab and possess a bit like the lovers try to do with their beloved, but actually let go of your possessiveness and need to control it. And so start to rest more broadly in that wider reality. That's a genuine perceptual transformation, I think, which Dante is suggesting. A second point that I wanted to draw our attention to is to think about the imagination, because this is, in a way, to say we've got to engage our imagination in ways that perhaps at first we can hardly understand. And William Blake thought about this a lot, of course, and in this famous remark, he tells us that, you know, we're all using our imagination all of the time. The question is, what's our imagination doing? Is it constrained or is it expansive? And so let me read through this remark and, and make a couple of comments about it. So he says in this notebook, which is now published as a vision of the last judgment, um, I assert for myself that I do not behold the outward creation and that to me it is a hindrance and not action. So what he's saying here is that the appearances, the outward of creation is not what he's beholding. And that if you do just stay on mere appearances, you're actually passively relating to the world. You're not actively engaged in your imaginative capacity to see beyond the outward. You're actually just trapped by the dominant cultural imagination, you might say. And so we're stuck in this created world, fixated on the outward creation. And so this is a kind of comment on how when, say, the scientific imagination, which is a form of imagination, there's absolutely no doubt about it. Maybe I should just qualify that slightly and say the scientistic imagination. Um, the narrower form of the scientific imagination. Um, when you aren't actively yourself engaged in looking, you're probably just caught by the scientific in our life and times. So Blake says, reclaim your imagination, not by denying the cultural norms, of course, but by questioning them, by engaging them, um, and by drawing on other resources that are around becoming active in your imaginative engagement with things. So then when he makes this remark, I assert for myself, I do not behold the outward creation and that to me it is a hindrance and not action. He imagines someone saying to him, what? It will be questioned. When the sun rises, do you not see a round disc of fire, someone like a guinea? And Blake replies, oh no, no. I see an innumerable company of the heavenly host crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. So he, with his engaged action imagination, doesn't just see the sun rising like a, a golden disc, you know, that looks like a guinea. Um, he sees in it the splendor of the divine life, hence the company of the heavenly host. And then he finishes with this final remark. He says, I question not my corporeal eye any more than I would question a window concerning a sight. I look through it and not with it. So what he's saying is that when you look out of a window, you don't fixate on the glass and ask, you know, what the glass is telling you, what the nature of the glass is, what reality the glass represents. You, of course, look through the glass and then you see the amazing scene that the window is framing. And he says, similarly, we shouldn't just rest with the embodied empirical senses, although we certainly need them to take us into the world. Um, but we look through the empirical senses, not with the empirical senses. And so this combination of the active imagination and the empirical engagement with the physical world means that the material reality isn't the only reality now for us, but becomes a kind of portal or a channel um, or a window onto a wider and wider reality that we can participate with too, and hence 
maybe even see the sun as the innumerable company of the heavenly host. And then just to um, offer another um, romantic thought thinker who, who makes a similar remark, Wordsworth's lines composed a few miles above Tintin Abbey include this thought where he says, therefore am I still a lover of the mountains and the woods and the mount, sorry, a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains and of all the mighty world of ear and eye both of what they half create and what perceive well pleased to recognize so there's this engagement that wordsworth's onto um it's what's perceived but what's also created in the human mind and that brings the delight that he's well pleased to recognize so i think we need to think a lot about the imagination um won't come as news to many here but Blake and others help us with that. A third thought I wanted to offer, and again, you'll you'll know that this comes a lot from Ian's work because of his um, discussion of the way that the right hemisphere is linked to the body, is to be embodied about this. I think actually, increasingly myself, that embodied practices are some of the best ways to bring about a conversion or expansion of perception, even an epiphany. Um, the heart has its reasons, Blaise Pascal famously remarks. Um, and I think what works, though, particularly well, is when embodiment is combined with intention, when you do some kind of activity that is almost a request to open things up, for things to be opened up for you. And so I put this picture of pilgrims setting out because pilgrimage, it feels to me, which is on a bit of a renewal right now um, in our times, is a very good way of practicing this. Um, you know, a pilgrimage is an embodied activity. Um, you know, it's an, an enactment of a journey um, to a destination that's not the same place as your starting point, of course. Um, but often on a pilgrimage, you carry a thought in your mind, maybe a person, maybe a situation, maybe a desire. And without engaging with it rationally, you allow the embodied practice to convert or change or, in, or address what's on your mind. And so, you know, going for pilgrimages, attending liturgies or rituals, practices that have a kind of pattern, you know, lighting a candle, bowing, raising hands. Other people will do other things. Um, I think, you know, that yoga and practices like that can be engaged in this way, too. These feel to me like really wonderful ways of trying to inculcate in ourselves um, the sense of the expanded imagination, the transformed perception um, that is so powerful in Ian's work. A fourth thought is love the minute particulars. This is a direct quote of Blake, of course, um, and it's in the particulars that the universal shows up. And Blake makes this very nice distinction between the universal, which is known in the one thing, because the one thing splendidly radiates and displays it to us, and that universal is different from generalizations. Generalizations are the kind of abstract laws, the kind of summaries of things that, if we're not careful, replace the territory with the map that the generalization seeks to capture. And of course, loving the minute particulars includes knowing thyself. Um, you know, you are the particular that you're closest to in some respects. So it includes that. But it's through the many particulars, the love of that which is immediate and around us, that we can gain this perceptual transformation as well. And so in the auguries of experience, auguries of innocence, auguries of innocence, which incidentally means a kind of openness and receptivity, innocence in that sense, not a kind of naivety. Blake famously writes, to see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Love the minute particulars. My third suggestion, fourth suggestion. The fifth one um, is to monitor how you experience time. Now, in the Divine Comedy, one of the things which you start to realise is that people experience time very differently in the three zones. In the Inferno, one of Botticelli's images here, there's basically no present. Everybody's fixated on the past or anxious about the future. Um, you know, they're worried about what they've done or they're um, beside themselves with fear of what's going to happen. And that, it 
turns out, is one of the key things that keeps them stuck. Because, of course, change only happens in the present. Change starts to appear in the purgatory, the second region, where people are able to contemplate the past and the future, but with this more active, dynamic sense that they can do it with who they are in the present as well. And so that is what brings about the long but steady and hopeful transformation of themselves. So there's present awareness there too. And then thirdly, in the Paradiso, Dante and Beatrice now are increasingly able to trans traverse different qualities of time. They can reflect on the past. They can love the future. They can be dynamically in the present. Um, here, Dante and Beatrice are shown with Peter, James and John in a wonderful image of Blake that captures something of that dynamism. And ultimately, they can know the part of reality that time's just a reflection of, which, of course, is eternity. And so move into that realm as well. And I was put onto this possibility myself through my psychotherapy practice because I noticed that um, you experience time very, very differently when you're sat in the therapeutic hour with someone. That kind of framing, that sort of limiting, if you like, throws into relief the experience of time that you have. And I realized that if you're watching the clock in a therapy session, you're probably not doing much therapy. You're, as it were, operating at a surface level. Whereas when you hardly noticed time passing at all and the session was over almost before it had begun, that's probably because something quite profound has been exchanged or shared or has shown up. And sort of by extension, I began to feel we have these timeless parts of ourselves that really made sense to me when I read the Divine Comedy and spoke and, and, and felt Dante and Beatrice's movement through chronos time, you might say, through chirological time to different notions of time that ultimately precipitated them into eternity itself. So my fifth suggestion is that we monitor how we experience time, maybe even, you know, during the course of the day and ask ourselves what level of reality are we engaged at in these different notions of time. And, you know, to throw in an obvious word of caution, when the day is more and more shaped by chronological time, because we keep these super accurate timepieces in our pockets, we're in danger of losing touch with these other aspects of time. And so trapping ourselves rather than departing in these ways. A sixth thought, I'm coming towards an end now, but I might just pursue towards the end. I'm slightly aware of the time now, having been talking about the time. I wanted to suggest that we consider our experiences in triangular ways. Now, let me try and say what I mean about this. This is some of the threefold symmetry that you can find in the Linda's Farm Gospels by way of illustration. And this is to think about what's going on for ourselves rather than in dyadic ways, you know, where you might say, so there's like there's me and my problem or there's me arguing with you, um, or, you know, there's me trying to understand myself. We need to escape these binaries by, when we're engaged in them, asking ourselves maybe quietly on the side, what third thing is trying to be born? What presence might be coming through too? This is a sort of psychotherapeutic insight again, because, very often people come to you because they've got so trapped with their problem and feel completely entangled in a kind of duality with them and their trouble. And in a way, they ask the therapist to be a kind of third that hears about that trouble, but isn't so entangled with it. And so can start to perceive possibilities that might lie around the binary. And I think that this is quite a general principle, actually, this triangulation of things. Um, David Bohm, again, in this conversation with Owen Barfield, he talks about how equations can have a triangular form. So rather than just being two things that are equal, um, a binary, he says the greatest equations in physics actually elicit 
a new perception of reality. And so the famous equations say that E equals MC squared is not just saying that energy in some way is equal to matter, but became the foundation of special relativity that opens up a whole new perception of the presence of time to us. A third thing emerged in this seemingly, seeming bi binary thing. Um, you know, in moral questions, I think this can be hugely valuable as well. We're very inclined in the modern world to treat morality and ethics as if it's a binary yes or no, right or wrong, good or bad. Um, but someone like Plato, I think, realised that we need a trinity of possibilities in order to dynamically move through life. And Plato's famous trinity was the good, the beautiful and the true. And it, it really works when you start to think about it. Um, if you've ever done a philosophy undergraduate degree, you'll know that when you do Kant and his categorical imperative, you'll consider the question of whether it's always bad to lie. And then your lecturer or your book will suggest, but what about the time that you're living in Nazi Germany and your Jewish neighbor calls and asks to be hidden in the attic? And in the next moment, the Nazi or Gestapo officer comes round and says to you, have you got your Jewish neighbor in your attic? And you follow Kant's catechism imperative and feel you ought to say yes. Now, the platonic gloss on this conundrum is that it's collapsed reality into a kind of binary. But if you open up that question into a trinity of the good, the beautiful and the true, the truth of the situation can be supported by what's good or what's beautiful. And so in that moment, know that it's good to say no to the Gestapo officer. I haven't got my Jewish neighbor in the attic. And there's something even beautiful about that because you're putting yourself on the line in that moment as well. So trinities in all sorts of ways, when you kind of get into them, start popping up um, and helping you into this more expansive awareness of things. Coming towards an end, I wanted to suggest that maybe other dynamics than just what we ourselves might start to engage would show up. You know, both Blake and Dante were very alert to the power of dreams, to the presence of angels, if I might say so, um, to synchronicities, to telepathies. And I wanted to go in that direction as well this evening, because I think that if we're serious about our own intellect, our own perception, then sometime or other it dawns on us that maybe this just isn't a human invention at all. But as Ian too talks about on occasion, that the brain in particular, but maybe the body too, is as much a receiver or a filter of wider intelligences, wider perceptions, that certainly most humans for most of history, I think, have taken for granted. And so have considered the possibility and the reality and the experience of angels, have taken dreams and synchronicities and so on, deeply, deeply, seriously. I actually think that this is a crucial area for the transformation of our culture. Um, you know, Human beings have always, until now, organised themselves, not just around their own concerns and survival, although that was clearly a factor, but around the concerns and realities that they knew one way or another to be embedded in the cosmos quite as much as they were. And hence, I think, we see the art from Paleolithic times right through to ancient times. The image there on the right is a shot of the Parthenon in Athens. And so I think we need to even be prepared to be spoken to if we're serious about this journey, to be approached, to be in conversation with the cosmos in ways that we might renew for our times, but that can be inspired by our forebears. I think this also means that we need to reconsider the experience of suffering because that is a reality too. And here's an image from the Divine Comedy again, right at the top of Mount Purgatory, Dante has to enter a wall of flame and he's terrified as you can see there. But what he's able to do this time is embrace this suffering, keeping his mind about it, 
unlike um, the time way back in the inferno where he collapsed in a swoon at the sight of what he saw. And this is so important because, you know, many of these spiritual traditions do tell us that part of our illumination is understanding our suffering. One says this cautiously, of course, because suffering is many different things. And sometimes suffering is something that needs to be aggressively challenged and ideally um, alleviated, you know, much like loss understood with the spectre. But there is a kind of suffering that actually is part of this journey too. Just to quickly now run through how Blake understood it. And with his fourfold perception, once again, you know, all row there reduces suffering to a statistic. And um, we saw a lot of this during the COVID pandemic. And this actually just leads us to be terrified because these bare statistics just stripped out the human reality. They didn't mean to, but they did increasingly. And, and with that, the kindness and the love that suffering can invoke as well. Generation, the second way of trying to be aware of reality. Um, it regards suffering as a kind of biomedical problem, ideally that will be removed. So it's like loss because it has ability, but it uses that ability to try and manipulate or control things primarily. And the upshot of this, I think we increasingly saw again through the pandemic was anxiety being loaded onto in the UK, the NHS, and no doubt other healthcare providers in other parts of the world. And anxiety that one knows when one works in the NHS, as I have done, it can't bear. And I think that's subtly part of the great challenge that it's facing, actually. It's not just a question of money. Um, it's a question of what's been asked of it, too. And that can be something that traps us when we treat suffering in a way of generation perception. Beulah, Blake's third way of perceiving things. Now, this now understands care in Beulah. It understands that kindness and humanity and love, that set and setting, that the manner in which you're treated, as well as the treatment that you receive, really matters and is part of the healing. But it also, I think, understands something else, that suffering itself can be a kind of birth pang um, that leads to a wider vision. And hence, in eternity, Blake's fourth perception. Suffering here, it's not so much that it makes sense, but that sense isn't destroyed by suffering. That meaning is known to be stronger, more powerful than what is being born. Um, we, we get hints of this in the present discussion, say, about Ukraine, in the way that Ukraine is holding on to its morale and that this is seemingly playing a huge important part in the war. And morale, you might say, is that the suffering that's being born is known to have meaning. Um, you know, maybe in moments at least, this suffering can even be welcomed because it's understood that it's through that path that a liberation might be found. Albion, in Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, Blake's great poem, um, he talks about how the furnaces of affliction have transformed into fountains of living water. So that's another thought that I wanted to throw in, a, you know, a really difficult one when you are suffering. Um, but I think Ian's work is relevant here too. Um, and this perceptual transformation can be engaged even in these dark moments. Coming to a conclusion, um, you'll be glad to know. Um, I wanted us to think as well about infinity, about eternity, and how it can sort of dazzle us and boggle us and make us wonder. But to love that, because these precipitous moments can tip us into a wider appreciation of these things as well. Here's Beatrice showing Dante something of the infinite in a high level of the Paradiso. Um, Ian references Nicholas Accuser a thinker from the late medieval, early modern period who is becoming increasingly of interest to some people again, actually. And he's wonderful for his thought experiments that can, in one moment, dazzle us with the sense of what reality might be like in its fullness, but also 
help us give a get a glimpse and a glance of it. One of the thought experiments I particularly like he uses is imagining a top spinning. And you know that you have to spin the top in order for it to gain instability. And in a way, the faster it spins, the more stable it might become. And so Nicholas Ocusa says, imagine a top that's spinning faster and faster and faster, and eventually spins with infinite speed. And then he says this remarkable thing. At that moment, you won't know whether the top is spinning or whether it's actually still, because every point on the top will be in every place, and it will look as much static as you know it to be spinning. I love these thought experiments that open our minds, open our imaginations, open our hearts even to know what that might be like. Um, so enjoy these intimations of the infinite, um, these tastes of infinity as well. And then finally, I run over my time, but hey, I hope that it's felt like it's time well spent, um, given what I've been saying. I think that we need to know that this whole journey um, is a comedy and uh, not just a tragedy. You'll know that in the medieval and the ancient meaning of the word comedy, um, it's ultimately a story of renewal and reversal, sometimes undoing, on occasion, maybe often tragedy too, but ultimately leading to delight. You know, much like the light can embrace the darkness, much like um, uh, the suffering can be born, so too, when you know that the story of life is a comedy, the tragic can find its place. And I think that a really important part of what Ian's unleashing and inviting into the world, as I receive it at least, is the kind of recovery and rediscovery of this kind of relationship with reality. You know, it's about how we might know once more that the source, the wellspring, however you want to express it, the spirit, the energy, the Tao, um, the divine, which was there before us, is closer to us than we are to ourselves, as well as transcending us, is the origin and beginning, as well as the end and the telos of our life. Learning to trust that once more, I think, is really crucially important in all this. Um, yeah, so, you know, if you'll forgive this sort of final overtly religious reflection, um, I think that we're on a path that's not one of evolution, as is usually meant, you know, that kind of meaningless, random jumble that sometimes throws up wonderful things. Um, we're not even on a path of emergence, as can be talked about in more spiritual inner circles these days. Um, we're actually on a path of return, I think, but return with the difference that self-consciously we can know that from whence we've come. Um, we can know that we are capable of spinning perfectly with the love that moves the sun and the other stars that our intelligence and our love, our reason, our emotion, you know, much like Bacon, Newton and Locke can join hands with Milton, Shakespeare and Chaucer in Blake, can come together to lift us, but also to take us into the intimate moments of the minute particulars. And so asserting this vision of things, I think is quite as important as the analysis, which is so valuable, and the hope and the practices which are so good too um, in our times. I've invited us to be interested in the darkness, to understand the imagination more fully, to be embodied with intention, to love the minute particulars because they're the gateway to the universal, to monitor our experience of time, to consider these thirds, the triangulation of reality, what's trying to be born in this thing that I feel so locked together with, the possibility of other intelligences, both natural and what we now call supernatural. The nature of suffering has got to be important in all this because suffering is around and it's going to be around. But the precipitousness of this endeavor as well, loving the infinite, the eternal, knowing that life is a comedy that can embrace 
and make sense of the tragedy ultimately. I think this is the invitation that Ian's book has put out to me and in this latest pass, if you like, through his thought um, has uh, fired in me even today. And I hope that that has come across in something of what I've been trying to say about this perceptual awakening. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, wonderful, enlightening talk. Um, I know we've got lots of comments and, and reflections flowing through the chat, so I'm just going to hand swiftly over to Ian um, for any comments and reflections on that first. Well, I'm just going to say it was a very rich talk, um, Mark. Thank you. You covered so many points and I could feel resonances in my work all through, so I won't talk about those. We're running out of time. I just thought I would mention, though, something I read in Rod Dreher's blog, I think yesterday, which I thought was very striking um, about suffering. He said, hope is not the conviction that things will get better, but rather the belief that all things, even suffering, have ultimate meaning. Perhaps that's a very good point to reflect on in relation to the very serious present crises that you mentioned. Anyway, I'm not going to take up any more time um, because there's little of it and I'm uh, handing over to the floor and Mary, can you um, yes, of course. take um, over I at this point? Yep. Thank you. There's lots of comments um, in the chat, but if anybody would like to unmute and raise your hand and um, verbally ask Mark, first of all, that, that would be great. Um, Clea, did you want to ask your question? Hi, um, yeah, I'm from Australia, so <laughs> I'm, yeah, on the other side of the world. Welcome. Um, I'm just, <laughs> thank you so much. I'm so, so excited to be here um, and to be able to meet um, Ian and Mark. Um, I've only just discovered you, Mark, um, a couple of weeks ago, so um, I've watched a few of your things on YouTube and, yeah, I'm totally excited. Um, but I do have a question um, that I'd like to ask um, both you, Mark, and I'd love um, a comment from Ian as well, or either or both of you. Um, I'm very interested in the concept of eternity and um, how we can access our sense of that. And um, I'm going back to Ian's um, work here um, on the right and left brain. Um, and just I, this is just a thought, and I'm just asking for comment. Not, it's not a specific question. Sorry, I'm a bit <laughs> nervous, so I'm a bit inarticulate. Um, anyway, my my question or thought is, um, and I'm hoping I'm understanding the functioning of the right and left brain here correctly. Um, if we think about the right brain as the brain that it is the experiential brain, so um, the part of us that is experiencing and perceiving the world in the here and now, so that now moment brain, um, and the left brain is the brain that's kind of making sense of that information, so thinking about um, our perceptions and trying to make sense and in a way orientating us to the, the reality that we've incarnated into. So um, basically as humans on this planet um, and then comes up with systems that we can then use to, um, to to make sense of the information. So this is our science, this is our um, maybe our um, organised religion. So these are all constructs to make sense of the world. Um, so these, um, these two sides of our brains are making sense of our reality. So how do we then use that information to then perceive the greater reality and then make sense of it, if that makes sense. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Um, hey, look, I could, I could just make a comment um, and, and, and maybe um, it's a sort of personal story that I think the time that I started to take the possibility of eternity seriously was actually when I was in my psychotherapy, my own psychoanalysis. And I was wrestling with my troubles. And gradually it became clearer, as you know, is a very standard discovery in psychotherapy, that they had history roots in my very early experience. And 
what was so striking about that was that it didn't matter to my psyche that what had troubled me when I was aged four or even younger, actually, I think, um, maybe even in the womb, it, my psyche didn't care that it had happened all those decades ago. It was quite as alive and real now as it was then. And although at first I was deeply troubled by this prospect because I thought, how on earth am I ever going to escape it then? But a thought that gradually started to emerge was this is a sort of timeless experience that I'm having. Um, and that was a moment of turning around because even though it was sort of in the midst of my own personal troubles, um, you know, which I did feel quite trapped by for quite a long time, um, there was a glimmer of a different perception there that I was sort of tasting something timeless. And so gradually, you know, started to take that very seriously indeed. This is that kind of right hemisphere awareness. This is how um, those right hemisphere kind of memories emerge. Um, I, I work as a, um, a counsellor in um, trauma and um, and family violence. So I'm very interested in how um, traumatic memories come back as a here and now experience, like these um, flashback type memories. And my understanding is that these are kind of a, a right brain experience but it's not just trauma memories that come up as a here and now thing it's all of our memories and when we get back into that experiential mode they become very here and now but the um the sense of eternity as well that sort of comes into it that eternal now moment um can i just uh, attempt to say something very brief about what you you've said I think my reflections are that eternity is not somehow the opposite of time. It is somehow the taking up and fulfillment of time. And that um, a theme that Mark was talking about um, that's important to me and was best expressed by Goethe, that we don't find the eternal by turning away from time, but by going through time. That we don't find the spiritual by turning away from the embodied, but by going through more deeply into the embodied and so forth. And that there are moments in time when it seems to stand still. Wordsworth described these, he called them spots of time in the prelude, there are these marvellous descriptions. And I have certainly experienced such moments and I know things that have happened in my life that I felt absolutely convinced at the time that they could never die. So I, I don't know what you make of that, but I also believe that time is very real and it's not a fiction, it's not something we made up. In fact, uh, the great Chinese sage Zhou Gen says that without time there would be no mountains, there would be no heavens, there would be no seas. Even God cannot, um, as it were, do away with time. So it's a very interesting topic. I'd love to talk about it for a very long time, but obviously I can't because there's lots more people wanting to ask questions. Yes, thank, thank you, Clea. I'm, I'm going to jump on to the next um, person whose hand is raised. Peter, did you want to unmute? <clears throat> You're in Vermont. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I've, uh, I'm, I'm terribly excited to be talking to you, Ian, um, and I hope to do it more. But um, And I had a succinct question, but the subject you just were talking about leads me to, the, to this one. Uh, a moment of mine was in 1953, my seven-year-old big brother was still not allowed near the river without his faded orange life jacket. On one sunny afternoon, a clumsy grown-up knocked it off the dock, and we watched as it sank like a stone. I'm not sure if I remember that or not, but it's so consistent with my subsequent life and the direction that everything took. Um, I... I tend to talk about it in terms of paradigm change. And the reason I do now is that I think humanity has just undergone one which we have not caught up with. And uh, so the, the things that we thought were keeping us afloat are no longer relevant. I'll stop there and see if you have any thoughts on this. 
Mark, could you hear that um, well enough from Peter? I, 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 I caught most of it. I mean, it felt like a, another reflection on what we've been saying. So, you know, oh. standing on its own terms, actually. So thank you, Peter. Yeah. Mm. Yes, I, I think that that's a good illustration of exactly what we're talking about here. Um, mm. And I, I just wanted to mention, since we seem to be talking about time, that it seems to me that Rilke, the, the German poet Rainer Maria Rilke, wrote about time more powerfully, more interestingly than any other poet. Mm. Um, thank you, um, Peter. And Christian, did you want to unmute and ask your question? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'll try to find eternity in the moment by keeping this short. Um, <laughs> given the <laughs> crisis we find ourselves in, I'm mostly interested in the practices, uh, which for you um, give you the motivational impulse to um, keep going on this inner path of revolution that we think is going to solve these things. So what practices do you find help you actually live this perspective personally mark you you you, yeah, you mentioned well, I, some i think uh, i mean i feel that um there's plenty of people trying to provide solutions and i'm mostly glad that they are um but what i feel increasingly called to is trying to articulate the vision that you know in some tiny tiny way but you know partly amplified because of what Ian's doing, um, who has, you know, a bigger audience and, and then maybe who knows where that can lead, because I'm, I feel sure that we need vision as well as just analysis, um, because the trouble with analysis, of course, is that it it stays within its own perceptual framework. Um, and so is at risk um, of perpetuating problems as much as trying to tackle problems. Um, and as is often said, you know, a crisis is almost a, or also a moment where a breakdown might lead to a breakthrough. And so I feel we need people trying to work on the breakthrough side as well. Um, and uh, insights from psychotherapy, figures like Dante and Blake, um, I, I want to bring them to the conversation. Um, and, and in particular, um, try and foster a revival, particularly in the Christian worldview, which is the one that I know the best. And I think has lost touch with this possibility of perceptual transformation very often too. It too can get locked into concerns about the material world, which of course are completely real, um, but maybe lose its own genius in that, um, that we need as well, which is this visionary side. Thank you. Christian, I think you were perhaps asking us for some practical things that we might do <laughs> and uh, as Mark said I tend to sidestep this for just the reasons that he said that the certain kind of left hemisphere way of thinking locks us into the problems rather than liberating us from it and I often quote Einstein who said we can't get out of the mess we have created for ourselves with the same thinking that got us into it but I think I would this may sound negative, but much as we've heard tonight, resistance and the negative and the contrary and the opposite are often very important ways to go when we're trying to achieve a goal. And what I would say has been important for me when I think about it is mainly the things I don't do. I don't have a television. I hardly ever listen to the radio now. I don't do social media at all. I'm very grateful that I have somebody, the kind Mary, who does this for me. But I don't. Um, I live somewhere where it's very silent. You cannot hear a road. You can't hear, perhaps once a week you might hear an aeroplane. But what you hear is suddenly in this silence, everything is happening. The, everything around you is alive. The trees, the hills, the cliffs, the waterfalls, the sea. Um, and so I have when I come to think about it, it's more about what I don't do, really. I create open spaces. I always say that um, life is, 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 it comes to us if we create the space for it. If we keep trying to make it happen, we force something that is our conception on it. And so one of the things in psychotherapy is to tell people to stop doing the things that they know they're doing that aren't working. 
try something completely different and opposite to that. So I know that's not very satisfactory. I could put it in a more um, compartmentalized way by saying, you know, practice mindfulness, listen to music, practice being alone with yourself and your thoughts, <laughs> um, uh, which is not to say don't enjoy your relationships. I enjoy mine very much. But I think it's something along those lines that I would say. And the attempt, very bad in my case, to reintegrate into my life certain spiritual practices such as um, prayer and little um, words and sayings of gratitude, of response to the world. Um, when I'm in the garden, it sounds rather um, uh, fey of me, but I do actually find myself talking to the plants <laughs> and just really saying thank you and bless you. So I think these practices somehow revivify the world for me. I can't really say any more than that. Mm. Super. Thank you. Thanks for your question, Christian and, and Mark and Ian. Um, I mean, maybe, 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 sorry, just maybe sorry, one more quick, very quick thought. Sorry, Mary. Just, uh, uh, someone just said to me the other day, um, love what the machine consciousness that so shapes our world doesn't love or even hates. So love inefficiency, love uncertainty, love obscurity, love nuance, love irresolution. And they were saying that even in a quite practical, you know, instead of getting frustrated because your question hasn't been answered, you know, by the web screen or whatever in an instant, say, ah, a moment where there's a different possibility. Very good. Um, Niels, <clears throat> Niels Hoffman, can I ask you to unmute? Did you want to ask your question? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm always in conflict with many things when I when I want to say something, <laughs> and I always find that there's not enough time to really dwell on on the on the essentials. Uh, I agree very much with 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 the talk tonight, but it seems to me it's very much symbolic language. Where is the reality? That can you see a reality? I see the right hemisphere as the reality because. I believe that the right hemisphere is where God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit, which can be seen as the, the universal inspiration. And uh, I have a whole life since childhood, I have lived that life. So all my time, it's always been wholeness. In fact, uh, I learned just the other day that, <clears throat> that uh, peace in Hebrew means wholeness <laughs> anyway well so my question is to Ian and both of you really this we if we know how the right hemisphere operates as a process like uh, like uh, whitehead was i've just been studying whitehead and i think what i what i invented more than 30 years ago actually resonates very powerfully with that. So when I joined this Ian's uh, uh, community, as we could call it, I already had ideas like, like that's now coming out through all Ian's work. And I find that fascinating. So I, I would love that's... to get involved. <laughs> so the uh, first thing, uh, I know no one Everyone believes that the right hemisphere, we cannot model that, but, but I, I can demonstrate it to you if you take enough time to take it in. But So mm. what, how would you see uh, this business of actually changing the mindset of the world into something that could save the world, so to speak? I think that is your vision, Ian. But, so I will ask it to both of you. <laughs> Imagine that we, we can actually, we can use that as a mindset. And if you well, read... That's, uh, that's very... Uh, yeah, sorry, over to you. Yeah. Well, no, not really. I think you have more important things to say than I have. Um, what you say is heartwarming and to an extent slightly overwhelming. Um, you place uh, yes. on me some sort yes. of... <laughs> a task here that I'm not sure I'm, I'm able to fulfill. But I think the fact that we all have certain values, 
all of us here today probably, that we share, that we don't see well embodied in the world. And I do, uh, I would repeat what Mark said, that it's a very good way of thinking about it is, and I'm constantly saying that, that these things that are driven out by the mechanical worldview of the left hemisphere are the things in which real meaning, real value lies. And they're the things we no longer value. Um, uh, imperfection in itself is something very valuable and perfection can be thought of as a kind of flaw. I just throw that out. But in any case, I yeah. think you know, that there are things we can, we can do together that certainly I can't do. But what I hope to have done is to provide um, a kind of a map and an inspiration so that people have some sense of where they might go next. And really, yes. that it's it's handing it over to 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 everybody here to take take things forward the best way that they can. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, I, thanks I, I, I understand. You don't believe that there is a, there is a certainty involved in in the reality that Whitehead talks about, and and that is not that is not just uh, subjective stuff. That is. Oh, I, I, real, well, real I don't want to go on very long because I, I think, I think we've nearly, we're over time or we're over time or, or already. But just let me say very, very briefly, I'm not saying there is no reality. Uh, that is absolutely the opposite of what I'm saying. I, I, there is I a reality, that, but it's yeah. neither made up by us nor simply out there. It's something oh. we encounter, and in the encounter we make it. Yeah. So that's what I would say. And I'm sorry we haven't got time to take things any I, further. I hope, yeah, Thank we you can, very much. we could continue a discussion mm -hmm. about this. Okay. Uh, just to say, okay. um, so I know lots of you have put comments in the chat and some reflections and observations. If you have specific questions, I know many of you here are, are members um, of Ian's um, channel with Goldcrest. So um, save the questions or formulate them perhaps in a, in a different way and post them in the um, Ask Ian um, chat um, ready for November. So that might be an idea. So don't um, lose your question, especially if you thought about it. And I'm sorry we couldn't get around to absolutely everybody. Um, but it's been an absolute delight to to host this. Um, it's been great to host Mark, and thank you, Mark, so much for for coming along 